and you're not having those conversations up front, you're not having a structure put into place, you're just not communicating about it. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for doing your best work more often. And of course, the thing that facilitates you to be able to do your best work is that cold, hard, dirty thing we call cash. So today we're going to be talking about give me my fucking money. And joining me today is my co-host, Ryan Willard. By the way, heads up, this is an explicit episode. So if you have little kids in the car, I probably should have told that ahead of time. Uh, we will be using adult language because this is an adult subject. Ryan, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Enoch. Pleasure to be here as always. Now, in in let's talk about language first of all. Is fucking is that a, is that such a terrible word in England as it is here in the United States of America? No, I I think the English were far better at swearing than the Americans. Actually, you guys have so many more words for just all sorts of nonsense. Over we there. we use this. We use swearing much more affectionately. You do. You, and, it's an art form. It's the Queen's English. Let's face it. it Exactly. And we, we use the C word, which is, I know in the America, that's incredibly rude, but we, that's a, a word that's reserved for your, your greatest friends and allies. Yeah, we don't want to use that on here. That would be taking a step too far. <laughs> I'm going to keep this, you know, just... Uh. So, Ryan, today we're talking about this idea of collections, right? We're yeah. talking about when we don't get paid. What do we do when we don't get paid? And this is something that is, this is happening all over the architecture industry it's so antiquated and there is a better way you don't need to deal with this anymore as a matter of fact my very first project when i was let go from my my architectural practice that i was working at when i started my own firm and i'm like okay that's it second time around i'm doing my own thing now you know we're making this happen i had a fun friend of mine who was a contractor and it was just a small little job it was a little cafe and all we were doing is I, he just wanted me to draw an exhaust vent because they were out of compliance, right? So it was a tiny little job. So I did some mechanical drawings, a little as-built, and got it all drawn up. It was $1,000. This was, this would have been mm, probably about 10 years ago. It's $1,000. I mean, a drop in the bucket, you know? But having just been laid off from my job, it was like $1,000 was a lot of money for me. That was like, that was like my, my house mortgage. You know, this, this money matters to me. And I can still remember the indignation I felt. I mean, I was so pissed off. When I go to collect, he's not paying me, he's not paying me, so I'm chasing him, this contract. Like, I'm having to chase him, I'm having to call him, having to text him. Now, fortunately, he's a member of my church, so I had a little bit of leverage on him, but still not enough. So I, like, bump into him in the hallway, and I was like, hey, where am I going to get my money? I've done the work, I gave you the drawings, everything's good to go. He's like, well, first of all, he kind of put me off, and he said, well, I haven't been paid yet, so we're playing the whole... I'll pay you when you pay me game, which that's, that's a non-starter. We do never do that. Never do that. This is not, we do not do that. Okay. Anyways, then he finally said, he's like, okay. Um, yeah, they decided that they're, they're not, you know, he didn't pay me like the con, like the contractor didn't get paid. So he's all there for, I'm not paying you. And I was like, bloody hell. There's my British swearing for you. I was like, blood. I was like, like, seriously, I have three small kids to feed. I'm basically making, I'll be lucky if I make $4,000 this month. And I just got fired from my, I, like, you won't pay me $1,000. Like, I did my job. I was like, how does this work? So mm -hmm. from the very start of my own practice, I was slammed face into this reality, which is common in architecture of people not getting paid. And, I mean, you'd be surprised by how many small practices deal with collections issues. Um, I remember my mentor back in the day, most of the time, he wouldn't even bother collecting. They, he'd sick his wife on him if it was a lot of money, and she'd get it because she was the bulldog. But he probably let tens of thousands of dollars go every single year because it was just, he's like, well, c'est la vie, I'm just going to go on to the next job. No sense in trying to collect that. Now, wild. there's four specific problems that, that potentially firms are dealing with around this idea of not getting paid. Problem number one is you're making money, but where is it? In other words, you're doing the work, you're anxious, you know, you're anxious to engage in a good cause. You're, you're actually doing the architecture, but then you look at the bank account and you're like, damn, why are we, why are we low this month? Where's all the money? And you know, in the back of your head that there's some invoices that haven't been paid and they're 30 days overdue, they're 60 days overdue, they're 90 days overdue. And the impact of this, Ryan, is? Yeah, you did, your cash flow gets impacted, your ability to make payroll, your stress levels are going to increase, the 
clients is effectively leveraging their risk on you, certainly with developers, and they're ultimately treating you like a bank, and except you're not making any interest on it for most for the most part, even though you might have a uh, a clause in your appointment contract that says that you can collect interest. Very rarely do I ever see architects actually execute on it or hold a client accountable. Well, our clients do because we force them to um, hold their feet to the fire. We, we, we make them. We make sure that they do do that. Um, but most of the time, we'll see architects who are not who are just collecting stuff late if at all well and that's the thing right it's like what i've seen in myself as well as other firm owners and i see this in myself in all areas of life is until the pain gets large enough i won't do anything to change it mm -hmm. so a lot of times we see that firm owners they don't actually worry about collecting unless they actually need the money like if they need the money then they'll go bound all the doors and they'll, they'll like be you know choking people out to get the money but if they have enough money in the bank uh, if you have enough money in the bank, if you can do your payroll and, you know, you, you don't see a huge impact, then, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe yeah, they'll pay, maybe they won't. Yeah, say that. Whatever. Be, uh, whatever. No, we'll, we'll, we'll see um, clients sometimes and they're like, oh, well, you know, it's like a bank account that we've got. It's like a savings account. That's how people relate to it. Ah, tell it's me like more. A it's like a savings account. and They like to mentally, they're like, oh, it's okay. We've got, you know, we've got a hundred grand. It's coming in. It's like. We've put it away for savings. There you go. And yes. we can run a lean, mean machine here. We don't need the money. It's okay. Or people will um, soften the reality of not of, a, of these kind of late payments with, uh, um, yeah, yeah. It's like we've got a we've got a bank account, and I don't want to appear needy. I don't want to appear like, you know, I don't want to appear like I need the money right now. Well, that's another because we, big because, too. because we've got problems in our own business. Which is kind of just bizarre, kind of messed basically. Up. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's it it really does start to set up a, a a relationship with the client where the parity is no longer equal. You know what I find? And the people who are most worried about appearing needy are the people who are the most needy. <laughs> and so if you want to stop yeah. feeling needy, stop being needy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And you just give me a brilliant idea, Ryan. I mean, I, this is the first, I, I'd heard this before, but I never put two and two together. I'm, I'm a little slow, let's face it. But what you, you talked about, you know, counting on this as like a savings account, you know, so I have collections and mentally mm -hmm. I'm going to say in my mind, well, there's outstanding money and I'm going to kind of count that as money. I've done this in the past as well. Like when it was outstanding money, I'm like, well, I know if time gets tough, I can go collect from those people. It's sort of like a account. So what I'm proposing, right, what if we, I'm going to start a Kickstarter it's going to be a new bank. And the way the bank works is you do free work for me. So if any of my listeners want to take me up on this, you do free architecture for me. I will, and that'll be your bank. And I'll just hold <laughs> that money for you for a long, long time. <laughs> I'll tell that. What do you, it sounds like a, I, this is a great, this is I a like great, it. This is, this is going to be, this is it. This is the next big thing. Yeah, exactly. Well, and, and like you said, here's the flip side is that clients treat you like a bank. Right. This is what. Let's face it. This is what's really happening, is other other especially. I mean, even even homeowners do it, but other established business people they're going to play this game with you, like mm -hmm. they're going to play the game. It's just the way businesses work. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. I remember talking with one of the clients who joined our program years ago, Canadian firm, high end design firm. They were doing great work, right? It's just like like you know these are your archetypal designers, and. And I was talking to them and they, they talked about collections. She's like, yeah, we just we just have a frequent problem of not getting paid for our projects. We'll do these restaurants. We'll pour a heart into them. We get published in the magazine. You know, the local AI, they, they do a tour or in their case, the Canadian Institute of Architect, Royal Architects, Royal Architects. Well, they'll, you know, um, they would be the OAA in their case, you know, comes by and organize a tour to see their project. And But they're like, but yeah, it's kind of embarrassing to admit that like we usually don't, we don't even get paid the last invoice or maybe the last two invoices we don't get paid. And and they said, I said, well, everyone else is getting, <coughs> everyone, no one else is getting paid either, right? Because they went under or there's no money in the bank. And there's like a silent pause. I'm like, no, well, I think everyone else is getting paid. I was like, well, why, how does that work? You know, like how many times have you asked and actually tried to get paid? And I'm like, well, you know, I mean, a couple of times. Moral of the story is, if you're not the squeaky wheel, you'll get, you'll get pushed down to the bottom. The, yeah. Of the, of the, the, I mean, the picking it, order. It, 
I, I think, and I don't want to justify it, and I want, you know, we've, well, I, mean, I think we've probably done, we've, we've spoken about this before on the podcast, um, and it's such a common issue with architects, and it really does reflect a whole load of, you know, a lack of confidence around money and a lack of assertiveness and personal power uh, around negotiating and just, you know, and just just in terms of feeling indebted to the client or feeling like we need the client. There is this kind of neediness of the architecture industry with with the client and then secretly we don't like the client because they're the, ob- they're the obstacle for us doing the great work, but they're a kind of necessary evil. All of this is just such an unhealthy um, psychology that we've got in the industry and it reflects itself into these this poor mechanism for making sure that we get paid. And other industries, particularly developers, they're very, very well aware that that architects are gentle, agreeable um, people and they know that it's probably a lot easier for them to just not pay the architect than it is to try and increase their financing with the bank or investors. So why not just leverage the architect because they're going to be happy. We can pay them late six months. They yeah. won't. They might. Yeah. They might charge us a little bit of interest on it, but they probably won't because they're just they're just grateful for the work. Exactly. They're just so grateful for the work, and I've been there. I mean, I remember sitting across from clients delivering proposals, and just feeling that and, and mentally, like I'm. There's like a grat. This is where it gets a little twisted because it's like a gratitude. A gratitude is awesome, right? Gratitude is a powerful place to be at, but it wasn't gratitude. It was more like, it was more like obedience or I'm not even sure if I say that word right but it's like sort of this obsequience it was like this 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 I'm putting myself on a lower pedestal like I'm so lucky to have you to be doing your project and I'm going to go all out and do it right so it's mm-hmm. so important to have parity so what ends up happening clients treat you like a bank meaning they don't pay you they kick your invoice down to the bottom of the heap until you ask for it 60 90 days or even further out ultimately what ends up happening potentially is you begin to resent your clients so these clients that don't pay you, you find excuses not to follow up. It's uncomfortable following up. Um, you don't want to be that annoying person. You don't want to damage the relationship with them. And so ultimately what ends up happening is like internally this resentment and just starts to build inside. Mm. It starts to fester. Mm. It's like an inner cancer. Oh, it, it, it's like it's, and it's so passive aggressive as well because it's, it's really twisted. I'll hear people say, oh, I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to upset the relationship. Oh, you know, we've been working with them for a long time. Oh, they're a new client that we want to work more with. Oh, they've got some fantastic projects. There's always some sort of excuse and some sort of, um, I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to upset them. And the reality is they've just rocked the boat. They're the ones that has been out of integrity with not, with not paying you. They're the ones that have damaged the professional code of conduct and levels of integrity that you brought to the team. So talk about it. Have a grown-up conversation about it. It's, it really just doesn't work for us to cower away and not have these kinds of conversations. I mean, prevention is always better than than the cure, and I and I totally appreciate how difficult some of these conversations can be, but they're often not as bad as we think. Well, Ryan, what is it when... What is it when human beings are in a relationship and one party blames himself for everything? Is there's, there's probably a psychological term for that. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe our listeners know. Some, it's, it's some kind of abusive relationship. For sure. Well, when you were saying that, I was like, this sounds very similar to like these women who get in these relationships with these men who beat them, like women who are in abusive relationships. Like they get beaten on a daily basis. And then you ask them, I know some of these women personally that I have seen go through this experience is very painful, very jacked up, very messed up. But it's a codependent relationship. They're like, you know, sort of like, if I don't get my beating for today, then I don't feel loved or something. It's, it's crazy. It's insane. And you say, mm-hmm. well, why don't you leave him? Well, he, you know, uh, I, he has trauma from his past. You know, he'll change someday. You know, um, he doesn't mean it. You know, I give him grace. Now, as jacked up as this analogy is, and, you know, this is horrifying that this happens in the world, that, like, people are in these kind of abusive relationships. Psychologically shown that these women will stay there. I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's, maybe I'm taking this way out of context, way too far. 
but it seems like there's some similarity here with architects and, 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 and clients that don't pay them. It's like you're kind of taking a financial beating and then you're the one blaming yourself for, oh, I shouldn't have spoken up. Oh, this is what the woman says. Oh, it's my fault that he beat me. I should be more submissive. I should do this. I did this wrong, blah, 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 blah. Instead of like, mm -hmm. forget this. I'm out of here, man. See you later, dude. You know, but it seems like. Well, there's the, the, the certainly a kind of survival mindset that kind of comes into this. And with the architects, I would certainly say that, you know, a lot of this dependency is coming out of scarcity and coming out of the fear of not being able to survive without this particular client. And it comes from a lack of esteem, if you like, of being able to generate and find projects and negotiate and have that kind of, uh, in, you know, a, that kind of personal power where you can go off and feel like you can create those, these scenarios or create abundant situations or create and find clients. It comes out of, it comes out of some kind of scarcity, whether it's a scarcity of, um, you know, financial and resource or a scarcity of feeling good or, whatever esteem is needed in order to be able to be empowered in life, if you like. I think you hit the nail on the head there because when we look at these codependent, going back to mar marriage or boyfriend, girlfriend, like these kind of romantic relationships that are messed up, mm -hmm. like I talked about, like a lot of times, whatever party is being abused, oftentimes it comes down to their esteem. Mm -hmm. It's how they see themselves. They don't see themselves as worthy of more, mm -hmm. right? They don't see that they don't have a higher self-regard. And so we see this in architecture and why it's happened, who knows, but it seems like we've bought the, the narrative of the, the other people outside of her. And so we bought the narrative of the developers. We bought the narrative of the homeowners. Here's the problem in architecture for us, for people practicing architecture is that generally the, the lay public, they don't, they don't get architecture. You know it. They don't understand uh, all the training, like what architects do. I mean, we know we talk about this a lot and a lot. And there's lots of complaints about, oh, no one understands what architects does, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact is, is that there's an oversimplification of what architects do that we need to face mm -hmm. that, you know, it's easy to look at what an architect does. And let's face it, because contractors do a lot of work out there, like contractors, you can understand what they do. And, you know, I mean, you can have someone with very little education, start up a general contracting company tomorrow. Now they might not be building skyscrapers, but they're, they can be building, they can be in business pretty quickly. Right. But what that contractor will never understand is that contractors never got to understand, you know, proportions of spaces never going to understand massing, never going to understand circulation patterns at the deep level the architects do, probably doesn't even know about some codes like egress, how far you need to, to go to be able to have an exit, how many exits are required for what occupancy, like all these things, which is just on the health and life safety side of architecture. So, well, let's face it, if you're an architect, if you're listening to this, you're probably an architect, so you get the complexity of being an architect. But what ends up happening is your clients in their own minds oversimplify what you do. And so, there's a struggle there for you to get compensated for the great work that you do and for all the value that you're bringing to a project. Mm. And I, I, I wonder as well that it may be at some level architects, there is a psychosis, an industry psychosis of just feeling like we don't deserve it. Absolutely. We're, we're, there's a mental illness. Yeah. And there's, there's a, there's definitely, if we look at education, um, a kind of narrative of the impoverished architect or the penance that we need to pay in order to be able to do good architecture. We've looked at this before, the psychology of, um, you know, some of the hidden belief systems that end up manifesting in architecture around, you know, profit and arch good architecture don't go together. If you're making a lot of money out of architecture, then the initial assumption is that obviously you're doing either morally corrupt work or the work that you're doing is is crap and it's just cheap and you're just kind of scooping off all the profits for yourself and you're not blah 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 and the, the reality of it couldn't be further from the from the truth but we're brought up with this kind of education and these belief systems end up finding their way into our into our minds and they all come into play when it's when there's money on the line and somebody hasn't paid us and then we choose not to do anything about it hundred percent. And I don't know about you, Ryan, but the way that I can speak about this, like you just did so eloquently is that I've thought and believed all these things myself. You know, I, um, when I first started working with a business mentor and I was running my architecture firm, 
I had I had a uh, situation with a client where they refused to pay my final part of the bill. And um, at the time, we were going into planning permission for something, and um, I was charging 50% up front for each stage of work. So at least that was something, and I had some sort of, you know, bit of, bit of protection. And the final 50%, um, the client said, we're not going to pay you on this because we don't like the design. We don't like what it's, what's, what's happened. And, and what happened in the project was it had been, we'd gone for what's called a pre-planning process in the UK. So pre-planning is like a tester. You show the planners, here's what we're planning on doing and submitting. Tell us if we're going to get permission for it. And they sent back and they said, you're not going to get permission for this, but if you change X, Y, and Z, then you'll be able to get permission. So we adapted the design, changed it all. We're about to submit it. And the client says, we don't like this design. That's not what we wanted. And guess what? We've spoken to another architect who used to work for the council, who used to work for the local authority, and they say that they know how to get us permission for exactly what it was that we wanted. So we're going with them, and we're not going to pay for this because this is not the design that we wanted, blah, 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 blah. Wow. Okay? And at the, at the time, I remember having this argument with the guy on the phone, and I was just, I didn't know where to go with it. I didn't know what to say. I was just kind of quite cut up about it, and... And I blame myself. I was like, oh, I should have known better. I'm clearly, I'm an architect. I don't, I, I don't know what I'm doing properly. I, you know, it's if this other architect, mind. yeah, it's, it's my fault. If, if this other architect can do it, he obviously knows more than I do. He's worked for the council. He knows all the, the rules. There's something I've missed. I've let these people down. And um, I started working with a business mentor. And then this was maybe 10 months later. And um, first thing that one of the first things uh, it was Johan. He asked me. He was like, "Right, so have you got any outstanding bills or anything? You know, where's uh, is there any money that's owed to you?" And I was like, "Well," he was like, "What does that well mean?" I said, "Well, there's this one client who never paid," and told him the story. And he said, "He said, okay, so were you in the wrong?" And I said, uh, "I don't know. I don't. I don't think I was actually." And he was like, "Well, go get your fucking money." Go get your fucking money. If they owe you money, go get it, right? You you did your 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 work. You did the drawings. You did what you said. You were acting with your best intentions. Um, you know, go and get it. And I ended up looking on the planning website just to see what had happened. And I saw how this other architect they paid had submitted all these other designs, which I knew were gonna get were gonna get rejected. And guess what had happened? Rejection, rejection, rejection. I was so happy when I saw this. I, it was literally like I told you. It was like I told you so. And this, uh, this other architect, you know, had, had made a real mess. Anyway, I remember I sent a message to the, to the client at that point and I said, hi, just checked in and looked online. And as we discussed, those proposals were going to go and get rejected, which I've seen that you've seen you've had. Please, you, ha you now have 14 days to pay me the remainder of the fee, which I attach the invoice for here, pay me this money or I'll see you in court. And 14 days went past and it was literally one hour to midnight. And I was like, right, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna here. have to get, I'm, I'm gonna have to get, get legal with these guys. And then the money came into my, my bank account and that was it. I never spoke to those guys again. Oh, but I got paid for the last minute. Yeah, <laughs> amazing! Wow. Well, good job. Right now, one of the things we do here in Smart Practice, the Smart Practice program. So, if you're listening to this and you feel like you need a little ass kicking to actually collect and stand up for your own value, well, come join Smart Practice. Have a chat with us. Reach out to us. We can see if Smart Practice is a fit for you. Now, as part of the program, we have we have a call that's called the Project Reclaim, which is a brilliant <sighs> idea that Ryan came up with. And it works very, very well. Now, also, Ryan, tell us about Project Reclaim. And you also came up with a playlist commemorating this call. And I'm just excited to share. I what, what, is, love, what is this? I love Project doing? Reclaim. It's like one of my favorite calls that we do in the week. And basically, um, you know, we started seeing a number of different practices coming into the Business of Architecture program. And, you know, a recurring problem was this late payments. Um, 
I think the worst we ever saw was somebody had about $2 million worth of unpaid fees and their business was doing around about $1.25 million um, gross sales every year. So this was like nearly double their entire revenue. Um, and that was one of the things when I saw that, that was just like bloody hell. This is, this is ridiculous. And we keep track on everybody's AR. So as part of the program, you have to submit what your total account receivables are. And then you have to um, uh, tell us how much is over 30 days. Okay, so in our, if, you're, if it's over 30 days, we consider that late. Even if you don't call it late with your own, with your own clients, we're going to consider it late. Um, and so then we want to know what the percentage of how much is late is of your total AR. And we've got a couple of grades in place. So if you're 0%, well done. You are what we call a high performing business. You don't need to attend the Project Reclaim classroom. If you're between 0 or 1 and 15%, that is acceptable. Okay, but just keep an eye on it, watch it. Okay, but between 1 and 15%, that's kind of what we would expect in a in a business just naturally operating that there's a few people here and there that are that are late and there's some sort of structure in place between 16 and 25 percent this is risk now we're getting risky and coming to the classroom now becomes optional anything above 25 percent it is mandatory for you to be coming to the project reclaim classrooms until you have reduced that amount and remind us okay. the, the percentages of what the percentage is the of your total AR, how much of your total accounts receivable is late. Yeah, there you go. And by late, yep. and by late, we're defining it as over 30 days. Yeah. Okay, so if you're above 25% of your total AR is late, this is urgent emergency problem. Okay. We need to get we need to get addressed. And you're not allowed to leave the classroom. You've got to keep coming to it week after week until you have reduced those numbers. And we've had some extraordinary kind of stories of success and i think people find it really really empowering it's not uncommon that you know people will come back and they'll just be like i've never had that kind of conversation with a client and we had um one client recently um uh, i think they're down in in washington or somewhere on the east coast somewhere down south on the east coast um and they were owed seventy thousand dollars and they hadn't done anything about it for weeks and weeks and they were worried they didn't want to upset the client they'd sent an email the email had been ignored they would maybe made some tentative phone calls and it was like right okay you need to you need to go and get the money and so we actually practiced some of the conversations that they might have with the with the developer um you know we always train people to have these conversations you don't need to be it doesn't need to be massively confrontational but it does mean that you don't leave the conversation until there's a very clear agreement in place, i.e. a date and a time of when the money is going to hit my bank account. Okay, Or if at the very, very worst scenario that you've got a date and a time for the next conversation, and at that next conversation, they'll be able to put into place a commitment of a date and a time for when their money is going to hit your bank. Okay, So each client, you do need to have a bit of a individual circumstance to see what's the best and appropriate strategy with um, that is at your discretion. Um, but with this particular client, it was really empowering. She sent off these emails. She jumped on the phone. She started, you know, basically standing up and respectfully demanding, where is my money? And the CEO of the company, the development company found out that they were late with the payments and he directly got on the phone with her and was incredibly apologetic and said, let me meet up with you. I'm so sorry about this. This will never happen again. Um, he wrote a check for her, immediately got her paid up and gave her his personal phone number and said, you send all invoices now directly to me. This will never happen wow. again. Now that's great because that shows, you know, that's a client with integrity. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it was really great. And, she's, and she was saying actually afterwards, that the relationship now with her and this client is better than it's ever been before because he really understood that he didn't want to be disrespecting his consultants like that. And she was just proud that she actually had the confidence to 
have the conversation with the people that she was dealing with and to escalate it and to manage to escalate it to as far up the food chain as possible. And she got paid. So that's the kind of thing that we have happen on the project reclaims. And we've got a number of people in there at the moment who every single week they report what their percentage is that's late. And we're looking to decrease that down to, you know, 15% or 0%. And we will train people in what kind of conversations to have, um, you know, what's happened to the client. Sometimes if they've got a client who's ghosting them, then we'll have to have more extreme forms of action. You know, sometimes it might need to get legal. Um, sometimes we've had people... Our, our clients actually go to the places of work of these clients that owe them money and knock on the door and have a conversation right then and there. That's, you know, sounds for some people that might sound kind of totally extreme, but it gets your clients, you know, people, people respond to when they know that you've come looking for your money. They don't want that to be happening. It's not good. <laughs> it's just, there's all sorts of, there's all sorts of stuff. Like you just, just being, you know, you don't want to be rude. You just want to deal with it and, you know, you start getting very um, awake to how much it's impacting somebody else. Um, and of course it works the other way because when architects are paid late, often what happens is now they can't pay their own consultants. And we work with a lot of um, what we might call sub consultants as well, who often they're working with architects who are getting paid late and then they get paid late. And, you know, our, our advice is often just bypass the, blooming architect if you can just go and get a direct agreement with the client um, themselves because in most cases you know the architect who's got the cheek of making a markup on the the reason why I say it, that it's a cheek for them making a markup because they're not doing anything to ensure that that person gets paid mm -hmm. on time yeah. and all consultants are just in this uh, kind of like paid when get paid acceptance and good luck trying to keep hold of a good consultant if you're constantly paying them late because of your own ineptitude of being able to hold your client accountable to paying you on time. And you're not having those conversations up front. You're not having a structure put into place. You're just not communicating about it. And again, prevention is so much better than, than cure, but we need to take this really, really seriously. So coming to the, uh, the playlist. So Ryan, what we'll do here, let's, well, let's, this is, we'll wrap this episode for now. We want you to come back next week where we're going to jump in. We're going to talk about the playlist because Ryan set up, uh, let's call it a musical theme for this call. And so we'll share that with you on next week's episode. Well, actually, it might actually even come out this week depending on our schedule, but it will be the very next episode we're going to jump into. So today we've gone over some of the problems and challenges that happen uh, when collections need to happen, when your AR is getting, when you're not getting paid for the, for the work that you do or you're getting paid late. Next week, we're going to talk about some of the, or in the upcoming episode, we'll talk about some of the possibilities. What does it look like when you make this problem disappear forever? And that's a wrap. Oh yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. Hey, a quick note. This is Enoch here, and I have a question for you. Do you know someone who's highly professional, loves speaking with people, and is skilled in the area of professional selling? Well, if so, I'm looking for a director of enrollment to join our team here at Business of Architecture. This is a sales position. And if you or someone you know wants to impact an industry and earn an excellent income doing so, head on over to businessofarchitecture.com for more information. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. 
Carpe Diem.